welcome to the fourth and final of our Turing Manchester project presentations. So these are retrospectives from our Turing fellows who've been doing projects based at Manchester. And for the final two talks, we've got Neil Speak from the School of Health and Nadia Papamichael from the Business School. So we're going to start with Niels. So Niels is Professor of Health Informatics in the School of Health, and he's going to talk about advancing methods, methodology for predictive healthcare. So over to Niels. Right, thank you, Magnus. Can you hear me okay? Good. Right, um, so hello everyone, and for those who do not know me, uh, my name is Neil Speak. I'm Professor of Health Informatics. Um, I work in the Division of Informatics, Imaging and Data Science in the School of Health Sciences, FBMH. Um, I'm also the, the Penko's Lead for Digital Health and Care. I'm going to talk I'm going to talk about advancing methodology for predictive health care, uh, which is a project that I led um, and which has uh, recently finished and which was funded through the Turing. Um, and before I go into the go to the menu for my talk, um, I just wanted to introduce the group of people that I work with um, in FBMH. Most of whom are, are actually based in the Center for Health Informatics, but a, a number of them, uh, a few of them are not. Uh, but we've got a, a really large group of people working on uh, prediction research and so methodologies for, for um, clinical risk prediction. Um, some of the work is more applied, some of the work is more theoretical. Um, and I think that's actually quite nice because the two things then can strengthen each other. Um, and most of the work that I'm going to present today was actually done by the people on this slide and not so much by me. So um, I think they should deserve due credit, specifically Matt Sperrin, who is here. I hope you can see my cursor, um, who led on, on, on most of the work. Um, so Right, so I've got highlighted here actually the people whose work I'm going to present today. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to start with an introduction. So when we say prediction models, what exactly is that we mean by that? Um, then um, I'm going to talk about one project that focuses, a sub-project which focuses specifically on the use of electronic health records to develop um, clinical prediction models. Um, then I'm going to talk about interventional risk prediction or causal risk prediction. Uh, and then the final topic is dynamic prediction models. And um, after that, I've got a couple of take home messages. So let's start with prediction models in health. So what exactly do we mean by that? Uh, well, it's fairly straightforward. So in a prediction model, we typically have a range of predictors. Uh, denoted here um, uh, by X1 through XP. So that would be things like age and sex, diagnosis, medical history, lifestyle, uh, clinical measurements, biomarkers, all those things that we can potentially know about a person, an individual. And then we've got some kind of model that predicts an outcome Y. Um, and typically um, that would be an event. So whether or not an event has happened in a given time frame, or it could be the time to that event that we are trying to predict. And obviously the two are very closely related. Um, and we can do this well, basically using any supervised learning method. So we can use good old regression models like logistic regression or Cox regression for time to event models, or we can use uh, something from machine learning, a random forest, sport vector machine, neural networks, all those things basically do it. So, broadly speaking, there exist two types of prediction models. The first type is diagnostic. These models predict the risk of the current presence of a disease of interest, given the stuff that we know about a person, given the things that we have observed. Um, Prognostic models predict the risk of a future event, typically some kind of trouble, stuff you don't want, for instance, dying or um, getting cancer or cancer occurrence or stuff like that, heart attacks. 
um, based on things that we know now, that we have observed now. So in this talk, I'm going to focus entirely on prognostic models because that is what we focus on within our group. So typically in a prognostic model, we can think of a timeline. So we've got a particular important point in time where we do the prediction, where we make the prediction. And then obviously we've got the time before that, which we uh, define as the, the observation window over which we have observed things in someone's medical history. Um, then we've got the prediction window over which we predict and then the end point. As I mentioned before, sometimes the prediction window, the length of that window is fixed. So for instance, we, we try to predict what is going to happen in the next 12 months, whether or not people would have a particular adverse event in the next 12 months. Sometimes it's not fixed, but we try to predict the time until that will happen. Um, Obviously, any study will always, always have an endpoint. So that means if we have time to event outcomes, there can always be, there will always be people for whom we do not know the outcome. We don't, and so they are basically censored at the end of our study. So prediction models typically have a life cycle and it's exactly what you would expect it to be. So we start by developing a model then we need to validate it. So we have to assess how good that model really is and whether, for instance, it would generalize to other settings, um, other countries perhaps. Um, if we have sufficient evidence that the model is valid, that it is accurate and that it, that it does generalize to the setting where we want to apply it, then we can, we can implement that model in clinical practice. Um, and then at some point, we probably want to consider updating that model because we know from experience that any model sooner or later be will become outdated. Uh, and that is just because things change over time, populations change, um, clinical practice changes. So at some point we will have to consider updating the model. Uh, where after, again, we will probably have to, to validate it. So um, it's, it's basically a, a circular activity. So the first project I want to discuss with you is around prediction with electronic health records. And this is a massively important topic in, in my field because nowadays nearly all the information that is collected in the NHS as, as well as in, in other healthcare systems is electronic. So um, we've got these vast databases of electronic health records that we can use to develop prediction models. So that's a tremendous opportunity that didn't exist, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Um, and it has the advantage also that the model that you then develop can be deployed directly in the setting where those electronic health records are being kept and collected. So electronic health records typically collect things like visits to general practice, measurements that would be made by that GP, for instance, a blood pressure measurement, uh, things like lab tests, um, whether any medication was prescribed or other treatments were prescribed, um, but also things in secondary care. So A&E visits or hospital admissions, visit to the outpatient clinic. All those things will be captured in electronic health records. Uh, some of that information is captured in primary care, so at the general practice, other information is, 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 is um, captured at the hospital. What is really important to recognize though, is that most of the time, there's not going to be any information simply because we are not visiting our GP or the hospital. So for instance, my GP didn't measure my blood pressure today, and they also didn't measure it yesterday, or actually not for, for quite, a, quite, quite a long time, a couple of years probably since it was last measured. I can't quite remember when that was and why it was, but it, it probably has been measured at some point. But um, it's fair to say and it's that you know the, the information in the records is actually quite sparse for most people. Um, George Repsack, who's someone who works in my field at Columbia University in New York, once said, um, 
the electronic health record, the data in the electronic health record is nearly always missing. And, and I think that's 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 the, a correct way of saying it, essentially. So information in the record is only recorded when you actually, when there's a reason, because you know you don't feel well and you visit your doctor, and otherwise it's just empty. So it's very, very different than traditional research data. So that's important when we start looking at that data and try to use it for prediction purposes, because it means that the, the very presence of information carries information itself. So the fact that something was measured is meaningful. And perhaps, for instance, so if a, if a blood pressure is measured, well, that means that if my blood pressure was measured today in my, in my general practice, that means I went there, right? So something, what, there, must, there must have been a reason that I went there. And maybe the blood pressure itself is fine. Uh, but the fact that it was measured is very, um, carries a lot of information. It says something. Um, so Rose Sisk, who's um, one of my PC students, um, is looking at this particular phenomenon, so which we call informative presence of information and op informative observation. Um, so informative observation pertains to the situation where we do multiple measurements over time, as we have here. So this is a blood glucose. This was actually measured in the hospital, not in primary care. And we've got two patients, patient one in, in blue and patient two in red. And for patient two, the blood glucose was fairly normal. Um, and it also wasn't measure, measured very often, whereas for patient one, the blood glucose was way too high and it was also measured much more often. And the two things are actually related because because that blood glucose was too high for patient one, it was decided each time to measure it very quickly again as they were trying to get it under control. Um, whereas in patient two, it was fine, so there was no need to assess it so often. They were not trying to get it under control. So the number of measurements is much lower. Now, one of the questions that Rose is looking at is how can we take advantage of this particular phenomenon that the very presence of information and the frequency with which, which, which things are being measured is informative itself. Uh, and this is something obviously that we would never see in conventional study data, for instance, from a trial. So Rose has conducted a review which was recently published in the Journal of the American Medical Informatics Association, JAMIA. Um, and in the review, she looked at so what, what, which, what kind of studies have appeared looking at these two phenomena, informative presence and informative observation. And basically what we found is that, broadly speaking, there are three ways to, to address this, at least if you look at the studies that have been published. So the first, uh, and this is also the, the largest group of studies, they basically define measurement patterns and then have predictors that indicate whether that a particular pattern was present or not and use that in the model. And very often then it is found indeed that the presence of those particular measurement patterns is predictive. Not all of them, but some of them are predictive of health outcomes. Um, then a second approach is uh, what we call modeling, modeling under informed presence, which was a, a much smaller group, four studies. And, and the final approach, which is probably the most general, but also the one that is most complex from, well, both a, a um, statistical and a, and a computational perspective, is using latent processes and, and, and structures. For instance, hidden Markov models um, can be used to model the type of process that we just saw on the previous slide. Um, or you can use joint models. So models basically model uh, the expected time until the next observation. And uh, in, in, uh, in the second part of the joint model, model the uh, time until the adverse event, so that the outcome model. Um, as I said, this is a relatively complex approach so from a computational perspective, but it is the one that is most general. So let's move on to the um, second project, which is about interventional risk prediction or causal risk prediction. Um, so these models that I, the, the, the prediction models are typically used in clinical practice to identify patients who are in need of getting an intervention. So for instance, there exist models that identify people who are at high risk, relatively high risk, of getting a heart attack or a stroke 
over the next five to ten years. And if that's the case, then guidelines, the NICE guidelines, uh, would typically say that an intervention has to be considered um, and that the typical intervention there is, is treatment with statins. Now, there's alternatives as well. So, for instance, in the first instance, what one might consider a lifestyle intervention. But from a medical perspective, it's statins that would be on the table as the possible way to address that risk. Um, now, there was a re really interesting paper from Miguel Hanan, um, one of my heroes, um, published in 2019 in, in, the, in the journal Chance. And, and Hanan said that identifying people with bad prognosis is very different from identifying the best course of action for preventing or treating a disease. And I think that's absolutely right. It's absolutely spot on, but not something that many people are aware of. And, and Miguel Hanan has really expressed it very well, I think, in this paper. Um, because it's also the case that if we use predictive models and try to use them for causal inference, then we might draw the wrong conclusions and therefore take the wrong decisions. So prediction models can inform us that decisions have to be made, but they can't help us to make the actual decisions. They can't tell us what, what needs to happen. So um, in contrast, if we, if we use a form of causal reasoning, then we can start to tackle questions as, you know, what is it that needs to happen? So this is an area that we've been looking at over the last couple of years. Uh, and, and we call this approach causal risk prediction or interventional risk prediction. Um, so also in this area, we've recently published a review. Um, so this work was conducted by Lee Jing Lin and, and Matt Sperrin. Uh, so this was published in a journal called Diagnostic and Prognostic Research. Um, what we did is basically identify approaches for making predictions under hypothetical interventions using causal reasoning methods. So at the intersection of prediction and causal inference, we found 12 papers in the literature that do this, both from statistical modeling and machine learning. And broadly speaking, we identified two approaches so the first is to develop a prediction model from observational data, as we always do, but then essentially plug in um, external estimates from causal effects from, for instance, a randomized trial or a systematic review of randomized trials. So we use two sources of information. One is purely causal and the other is observational, and we use that to develop the model where we plug in those causal uh, effect estimates. The second approach is different. Uh, it uses only one source of information, observational data, as, as we always tend to do, but it now uses methods um, from counterfactual reasoning to estimate those um, causal effect estimates directly from the observational data. Now, this one is much more challenging. It's also potentially an approach with which we can do more, um, but it's 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 challenging, and it also we have to make a number of assumptions, for instance, uh, on observed confounding in the observational data. Um, otherwise, we can't make it happen, and those assumptions might sometimes be wrong. Right. So the third and last project I'm going to discuss is dynamic prediction models. Um, so. I alluded already that patient populations, um, health conditions, healthcare practice tend to change over time. Usually that is a reason, reasonably slow process, but sometimes it is actually very quick. And we've seen that obviously in the pandemic where things have changed very, very quickly. Um, now prediction models, the, 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 the type of prediction models that we discussed earlier, are all static, so they, they won't change over time, which means that they can be become outdated very quickly. Um, so there was a nice example published a number of years ago by Graeme Hickey, who used to work in Manchester, is now in Liverpool, um, based on the Euroscore, which is a model actually that is being used in clinical practice to predict outcomes of cardiac surgery. And um, over time, the Euroscore predictions kept going up, whereas the actual mortality rate, so this model predicts mortality, kept going down. So essentially what this told us is that 
the model was becoming more and more outdated. And I think this is happening for a lot of these models. So looking at these data, it's probably better to move on to a, to a different type of model that changes over time, which is always going to be better. So that's what we call a dynamic prediction model. And Dave Jenkins, who's a PhD student in my team, works on this topic. He's published a couple of papers on the, uh, the topic. Um, if you look at the, the literature in this area, then you can you can see three approaches to do this. And this is, you know, basically what you would expect. So the first is updating a model in discrete steps. So every month or every year or so, you update the model. Um, the slightly more radical approach, but also more demanding, is do is model update the model continuously. So whenever a new observation comes in, you update the model. Um, for that, it, it is naturally to move to Bayesian stats rather than sticking to frequentist stats. Um, and I think in a Bayesian framework, you can do this actually in a, in a very natural way. Um, the final approach that we weren't aware of when we started this actually is, called some, is something called varying coefficients. So here we model the relation between predictors and outcome as a function of calendar time. So that's quite interesting. Um, instead of having a constant coefficient, we now have a function of calendar time that tells us how that coefficient is changing over time. Now, obviously, when we move from static to dynamic prediction models, there's a question around what does this do with the prediction modeling life cycle that we discussed earlier? So clearly, the model updating as a step is now gone because the model itself has become dynamic, but uh, most importantly, this raises questions around validation, because how do we prove that a model that is changing all the time is still valid, is always valid and accurate? I think that's the main still unresolved question in, in this area. And we've looked at you know, different potential approaches to do this, um, but I don't think we've we've yet found the ultimate solution. Uh, certain approaches certainly wouldn't work. So, for instance, only validating the initial model. So then you don't know what happens after the model has been updated for a while. Um, one approach would be to validate periodically. Um, and I guess the most advanced approach, but one that for which we haven't got the methodology yet, is to validate the initial model plus the updating procedure. So basically prove that the model would always be accurate um, regardless of the, the number of updating steps that have been applied. Okay, so this brings me to my final slide with the um, summary and, and take home messages from my talk. Um, so we've spoken about electronic health records um, and seen that they are fundamentally different than traditional research data, and this has implications for risk prediction. So they force us to model phenomena like informative presence and informative observation. Secondly, purely predictive models can inform us that decisions have to be made, but they can't help us to make the decisions themselves. They can't tell us what should happen. And so there is an emerging class of interventional or causal prediction models which can support decision making. And this is the second topic that we're working on. Um, and finally, populations and health services are naturally dynamic. They change over time. Taking that into account requires a move from static to, prediction, to dynamic prediction models. Um, that's relatively straightforward to do, but there's a big question mark still around how you validate dynamic prediction models. Okay, I've included a couple of uh, recent papers from our group on this slide. I'll make sure that the slides will are made available after the talk. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank my group again for the fantastic work that they've been doing. And thank you for listening. Thanks, Niels. Uh, and I have to give a virtual, virtual applause. Um, and. Uh, uh, if you have any questions, then you can either type them into the chat or uh, feel free to just uh, switch on your mic and ask Niels. Um, but I'll, I'll maybe kick off um, 
I mean, it's it's great to see the ways in which these prediction models can be improved to incorporate all these features. In practice, are there prediction models now that are dynamic, causal, and take into account uh, missing this in a sensible way, or is or is this qu quite futuristic? Yeah, this is like this is quite futuristic. Um, I'm aware of a couple of models. So the first thing perhaps to say is that there are not too many prediction models that are being used in clinical practice. Um, so there's a bit of a translational gap, I would say. If you look at the number of prediction modeling papers that appear in the, in the scientific literature, and then the number of models that are actually being used, for instance, in the NHS, that's quite a difference. Um, I'm aware of one model, I think, yeah, that has plugged in causal effect estimates from a trial. So this is in, in the domain of breast cancer. So it can help you to decide what to de what decision to make. So it's an interventional prediction model. Um, and that one's available online. Uh, but otherwise, I'm not aware of any model that would do any of these things. And I think it's, yeah, we that, that that's quite far away still. And, and how, how feasible is it, do you think, to make causal predictive models from observational data versus doing trials in order to build models? Because I guess in some cases, is it just impossible to make those causal inferences? It certainly is, it certainly is, yeah. So um, I guess, you know, one of the classical examples is, is lifestyle. So every GP would like to inform, will, will inform their patients if they have a high risk of, say, heart disease, of the benefits of, of lifestyle. And what they tend to do is also use some of the models. So there's a model that they tend to use called Q-Risk to illustrate that. But the way they do that is actually wrong because right. the model wasn't meant for that. So the numbers that they are then showing are just incorrect. Uh, but there's a huge need. But I think lifestyle interventions like smoking, physical activity, etc., is a very good example where I don't, I'm not so sure that we will ever have the data to do that because it's, it's super complex from a conf confounding perspective and you would need accurate data from, you know, real life. Again, something that we typically don't have. And then those kind of problems, there are lots of hidden latent confounders that you don't know, I suppose. Exactly. And probably lots of population stratification that you don't know about as well. Yeah. Uh, which is, yeah. Great. Um, so any, any questions from Niels from anyone else? Um, if not, please uh, do feel free to contact Niels, ask for clarification on anything, or if you're interested in following up, he's, the, the talk is recorded so you can see the slides. <clears throat> And I think uh, I'm not sure if we'll put a copy of the slides there as well, but either way, you can you can see them in the video. So uh, let's thank Niels once more. <clears throat> and um, um, our next speaker is uh, Nadia Papamichael uh, from the Alliance Manchester Business School. And Nadia is going to talk to us about explanatory tools for probabilistic graphical models. So Nadia, when you're ready, please share your screen. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. That's it. Can you see it? Uh, it yeah. Yeah. It's perfect. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Magnus. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, Nadia Papa Michael, and I'm going to talk about explanatory tools for for probabilistic graphical models. And this is indeed uh, um, uh, one uh, small Turing project. Uh, that uh, we got. Just let me tell you a few more things about myself and uh, my collaborators. Uh, I'm based in the business school and um, uh, I used to be a computer scientist and my research interests fall under the themes of decision analysis, behavior and support. And uh, many colleagues uh, in the US, they use now the term decision analytics uh, in order really to illustrate uh, this kind of interest. And uh, many years ago, uh, I worked with uh, uh, Jim Smith uh, from the University of Warwick 
and uh, we published my first ever paper in artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, when we both became a Turing Fellows, uh, and this is the magic of the Turing Institute, we got back together and we had this idea about uh, the, the project I'm going to discuss today. And uh, we are lucky enough uh, because we have a third collaborator, uh, George Dimitrio. And over here, you know, on this slide, you can see our research interests, uh, decision analytics, Bayesian uh, decision analysis, and natural language processing. And these are three areas, three skills that we needed in order to implement and, uh, you know, this kind of project. Uh, this is an overview for my presentation is why do we need to talk about this kind of topic? Uh, I'm going to, to show you what we've done with the project, how it is linked to other projects, and then uh, I'm going to uh, have a brief discussion of outputs and our future plans. Um, first of all, you, you know, just why is it important to talk about explanation systems uh, in any kind of decision uh, setting? Um, let me give you an example. Um, as an academic, I often have to take decisions that might affect my students, their well-being and their future. Maybe some of the decisions are about marking or some of the decisions are um, of uh, the type, you know, whether, you know, to take on a, a, an extra PhD student. And when I take this kind of decisions and often agonize over them, uh, I often do the, the check if the student was facing me, would I be able to defend my decision? Would I be able to explain my decision to the student? And if the answer is yes, then I feel the decision is right. You know, it is, this is a kind of validation. And uh, indeed, uh, you know, this is uh, really the principle of GDPR. If you, if we as human beings have to justify our decisions, then machines and tools that provide predictions or the, you know, take decisions that affect other people's lives, they have really to justify their own decisions. And at the Turing Institute, there has been a lot of research, and uh, this is, uh, you know, the case for explainability and the case for developing explanation systems has been highlighted by many researchers. For example, David Leslie uh, has led uh, efforts with uh, uh, with uh, his reports, but also uh, Sandra Watcher, if I pronounce his surname correctly. They have really put explainability on the Turing map, but also uh, on the map of the wider community. Uh, so explainability fee is a very good fit with many of the Turing priorities, and it's all about providing transparency and uh, all about, you know, it's all about in our efforts in order really to make machine decisions fair, ethical and transparent. Uh, and these are, you know, the aims and objectives. And uh, when I joined the Turing Institute and when I, I started the project and I put together the proposal, initially my plan was to develop explanation tools uh, in order really to provide a contextual and reasoning kind of explanations for probabilistic graphical models. Uh, but in our team, you know, just very soon it became very apparent that the emphasis of the project should be on the dialogue, developing a dialogue between different stakeholders expert domain uh, domain experts, decision makers and tools uh, and the tools that we wanted to develop. And there's also uh, another focus on the facilitation, how to help domain experts out there to construct probabilistic graphical models when it's not really possible to have access uh, to a facilitator or to a human being or a decision analyst. Uh, in, in, in the Turing and in the wider community of data scientists and artificial intelligence developers, this is a very typical uh, workflow uh, where people uh, try to develop um, usually a black box kind of uh, technology and then they, they provide the outputs of the system to a potential user. And uh, if there is an explanation component, then it's all about providing some post hoc uh, uh, explanations uh, about the output. And uh, in some cases, depending on the black box technology that has been used, uh, maybe there is a chance to add transparency into the system, but providing a bit of information about the logic uh, of the model. But again, this depends on the technology used in the black box. But let me now show you what I do. Uh, I, I 
really help people develop decision models in order really to take decisions that matter. And uh, Niels, uh, before uh, that was a, it was a happy coincidence that uh, you know we were paired together. But you know my emphasis, the emphasis of my own research is on helping people uh, to devise the best course of action. But usually, you know, it's all about uh, I have acted before as a decision analyst and as a facilitator, and I help people to develop uh, their own decision model. My collaborator, Jim Smith, uh, who really wanted uh, very much to be here today, but all day today he is committed in, uh, to a decision workshop with some clients and uh, they are trying uh, to establish and capture a probabilistic graphical model. And the projects, examples of projects um, uh, that uh, um, Jim, for example, uh, has developed for the Turing Institute uh, is um, a probabilistic graphical model uh, to calculate the risk of a terrorist or of a criminal who is about to be reintroduced to society, uh, and what is the risk of reoffending again? Uh, but when it comes to these probabilistic graphical models, you can have them in many different domains, for example, climate change. Uh, what's the probability of a comet, uh, uh, you know, hitting planet Earth or uh, uh, a probabilistic graphical model, for example, about the population of bees uh, that are, have been decreasing. And in this kind of setting, uh, we have a decision analyst and a facilitator who helps a group, one decision domain expert or a group of domain experts uh, in order really to capture this probabilistic graphical model that describes the essence, you know, and, and the logic of making predictions about risk. Uh, but, um, and, you know, in these particular settings, as I said before, we assume that we have the presence of a decision analyst or a facilitator. But then what happens in cases where the data is confidential or sensitive and perhaps the domain experts um, they don't really want to use a decision analyst or a facilitator, or perhaps it's very costly in order to have continuous access to a facilitator. If we don't have a, an analyst or a facilitator, this is where we come along. And this is really what we want to do as a team. We really want to develop explanatory tools to replace facilitators in decision workshops so that instead of having interactions between domain experts and a facilitator in order to build the probabilistic graphical model, what we want to do is to have a dialogue between the tool and the experts. And some of the explanations will be inferred, uh, you know, from the structure of the network or uh, from uh, the kind of values and probabilities we might have. But there might be some cases where the domain experts in this dialogue with the tool, they might think, oh, you, you, you know, just how uh, the, there is another variable of interest that they did not really include in my model. So maybe, you know, they might be able to deduce uh, and go uh, back. So we have really these kind of interactions going both ways. And uh, these are the research choices we have made. Uh, um, uh, we call uh, our tools Galaxa and uh, the vision is to develop a suite or a family of, uh, of uh, tools that can be that can have chatbot functionalities. So if you wonder why we, we chose uh, the name Galaxa, the idea was that, uh, you know, the time when we coined the term, you know, just many people we knew were using Alexa and we thought, you know, what we want to do and this is the long term vision is to develop uh, Alexa kind of tools for probabilistic uh, graphical models. Uh, uh, then when it came to probabilistic graphical models, we decided to focus on Bayesian networks. Uh, I have to say that uh, when I joined the Turing Institute, um, and this is my own personal observation, but I would say a very high percentage of Turing fellows and many people associated with the Institute, uh, they do a kind, uh, they apply Bayesian kind of methodologies, but in our case, we focus on Bayesian networks. Uh, they have been used, um, you know, in many, in many any uh, applications. Uh, my collaborator, uh, Jim Smith, has written uh, a book, you know, on the Bayesian decision analysis. So that was uh, really, for the very, very, very beginning, that was our aim. I had developed explanatory tools for other domains. 
Um, uh, Jim uh, has done a lot of research with Bayesian network, so it was really a very good uh, fit to do this kind of thing. So when George joined us with his expertise in natural language processing, uh, we had a very good mix. And I, I would like to reiterate that the applications uh, we are focusing upon are applications where it's very difficult to hire a facilitator or perhaps the information is sensitive or confidential. Um, now, um, we have a decision facilitator like someone like Jim Smith, who interacts with decision experts in order to build the probabilistic uh, graphical model. What is the process? Uh, because if we want really to replace the decision analyst and replicate this kind of dialogues between tools and, uh, uh, and domain experts, it's very, very important to have a high level overview of the decision analysis process that is being followed in order really to elicit uh, probabilities or in order to elicit uh, the, the structure of the probabilistic graphical model. And I have to say that if you open tight textbooks, this is not the kind of formation you can find in textbooks. Usually in papers, people present the final product. Uh, and uh, many facilitators will tell you it is a kind of art how you can guide people uh, in order uh, to develop this kind of models. But the first phase is, you know, the initial structure where people start to think about the problem, to try to, to make sense of the problem. And they try really to think what are the variables or, um, that are really of interest and what are their dependencies. And then in the second stage, uh, it's more about refining the graph and defining the structure. In the third uh, phase, it's all about the listening probabilities and there are some very well established techniques and approaches um, like Shelf or uh, Roger Cook, you know, they have done uh, a lot of work in the area. And finally, you know, just at the end is this kind of verification. Uh, you know, I'm happy with the final product. Uh, have I got um, a graph with uh, the right kind of variables? Um, maybe, you know, should I include any other variables? You know, this kind of thing. And uh, this is an example of a Bayesian uh, network. Um, and I'm not going to bore you with details. I think those of you who have um, expertise in the area, you will recognize this example. It is really a toy example uh, that many people use in the textbooks or when uh, they teach. Uh, and we have got this example from the Netica software uh, that uh, helps um, uh, users to develop Bayesian belief uh, networks. But in this particular example, uh, we have uh, a number of potential diseases, for example, tuberculosis, lung cancer, bronchitis. We have some output variables, uh, 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 x-ray results or dyspnea. But, you know, this is the kind of explanation and the query, you know, just if, if we had a domain expert or if we had a user interacting, directly interacting uh, with this uh, um, uh, tool, this is the kind of question they could have. For example, what is the probability that a patient that comes through the door uh, uh, so what is the, the probability that this patient has a diagnosis of cancer or tuberculosis based on the fact that the person is a smoker and or uh, has traveled abroad? Um, uh, so, so it is this kind of setting. So given this, what we want to do is on top of the Bayesian belief network that is being displayed in a, in a software like Kinetica to have a kind of Galaxa chatbot. And this chatbot is going to be a dialogue-based system that is going to help users to construct and interrogate uh, by easy networks. And there are two aims here. The one, the first aim is to develop an explanatory tool in order really to develop explanations at the end, uh, you know, so that people get, uh, you know, if they ask, oh, what is the probability of that? What is the probability of this? If uh, this, uh, if I observe this uh, and so on. But also the second aim is, you know, the, this kind of facilitation. Uh, how can we help domain experts out there to develop their own uh, Bayesian networks? How can we facilitate this kind of interactions between um, uh, the Bayesian network and the domain experts? 
Uh, and uh, over here, you know, I've tried to answer, you know, some questions you might have. Why Netica? It's easy to use, a uh, powerful program, uh, um, and also for the other different components of uh, our uh, Galaxy tools. Uh, we have uh, used, for example, for uh, the dialogue module, we have used uh, RASA, or for the explanation module, we have used uh, SIPL NLG. And if you have any questions about these particular tools, um, you know, the solution has been developed by my collaborator, George Dimitrio, who is attending uh, the presentations today. And I've noted before that I think it was Magnus uh, said, you know, if you want really to ha if you have any questions, you can use the chat facility. And uh, George will be also available by a chat if you want really to get quick answers uh, to any questions you might have about the natural language generation component. And this is really the high level architecture of uh, the tool. Uh, we have uh, the user and the user says, you know, I would like really to construct a Bayes net. And then, uh, you know, just uh, uh, one component is the chatbot and the chatbot has two parts. One part uh, does uh, uh, text um, understandability and the other one is all about managing the dialogue. Uh, so the first really task is to establish the intent. So when someone says I would like really to create a Bayes net, what is the intent? of that. And then you notice after establishing the intent of the query, then the next step is to devise a number of action plans. Uh, because very often you notice there are follow up questions. Uh, for, uh, uh, for, uh, and it, it is about really devising an action plan in order to interrogate the user or the domain expert a bit further in order really to elicit more information about the structure of the model or about uh, the probabilities. And uh, all, you know, just uh, once, uh, you know, the uh, the structure and um, of uh, the, the network has been established and uh, probability elicitation has taken place, uh, it is uh, possible then uh, to invoke uh, Netica and display the Bayesian network on Netica. And then uh, we have uh, another uh, simple NLG kind of solution in order really to generate explanations. And over here, I have an example. Uh, for example, uh, the answer to the question, what is the probability of tuberculosis, given that the X-ray is abnormal and there was a visit abroad, then you can have uh, this kind of explanation by, uh, the, uh, uh, by the natural language generator. I would like to really to just, uh, just two takeaway messages from this. The first takeaway message is we have not really tried to, re to replicate the whale. You know, that was a small Turing project. What we wanted to do is we wanted really to develop a proof of concept to see, to demonstrate that our ideas worked. So it was not really our intention, for example, uh, to develop a visualization tool for Bayesian networks when there are tools out there like Netica that do exactly that. So, uh, it, it was all about using open source technology uh, in order really to develop our solution. And this is really, and the other takeaway message is that, you know, this is work in progress because, you know, we have completed the six month project, uh, but we have really continued with our meetings and uh, uh, in order really uh, to uh, develop a complete solution uh, and uh, that can be used in uh, decision centers uh, where the aim is uh, to develop a complete Bayesian uh, belief uh, network. And so far what we have uh, done is uh, we have uh, implemented this kind of chatbot uh, where we have basic kind of conversations between a user and the chatbot component of Galaxa. And also we have uh, completed this kind of interaction between uh, the explanation generator and Netica. Uh, so it is possible for the explanation generator uh, to invoke the API of Netica and uh, answer uh, uh, some of the questions. Uh, but what we have done is, uh, and this is now the next step, is to integrate all these components together because the final aim is to develop an integrated decision support system that can provide, uh, uh, you know, just a unique uh, solution uh, to uh, our problem. Uh, now, what is the link? You know, this is, as I said, a work in progress, but uh, there are other spin-offs in, in place. 
And uh, something else uh, that uh, I do is about uh, the effect of explanations on uh, different users. I am one of the believers that one size does not really fit all and people out there, they're very different. So when you have any kind of system, it can be a black box or it can be a probabilistic or, or a risk model uh, and that system provides explanations uh, to a user. That's not really enough because you don't really know how people use the explanation. And if uh, the, the system is in the health sector, for example, and Neil uh, has given some amazing examples and he's been doing a lot of work, but if you have a system that gives a, um, a risk estimation and uh, the, uh, communicates to uh, to a patient, for example, that the probability of you uh, having cancer uh, or in later life or the probability of diabetes in later life is this, the one million dollar question or the one million pound question, in my opinion, is uh, yes, but what is next? Is it possible to change behavior? Uh, so can we go a step farther and not only to generate explanations, but also kind of do a bit of nudging, try to influence behavior and try really to help people to devise the best intervention plan for them and how we can help them to do that. And um, I'm uh, lucky enough, we just got um, uh, a targeted PhD scholarship and this is a collaboration with another a fellow, a Manchester fellow this time, Ken Muir. And in our team, we have epidemiology people, we have market marketing people. I, I have done a lot of work on decision behavior and it's all about if we take into account individual characteristics, for example, decision making style, information processing style, how can we personalize the explanation messages we send uh, to our users in order really to initiate intervention plans and changes, lifestyle changes in them. Uh, so a PhD, we've just appointed a PhD student and he's going to keep us busy for the next three, three or four years. And um, of course, you know, just uh, I have done a lot of research, you know, this is really my passion. Uh, and um, uh, and before when Niels was uh, giving his presentation, uh, he was saying how important it is to identify the best course of action, sometimes from preventing diseases. And I, I, I'm also uh, very passionate about the part of decision analytics. It's all about how we can use a range of different methods in order to help policymakers, decision makers to devise the best course of function. It might be an intervention. Um, uh, and uh, uh, and this is uh, really what I do. And, uh, and the idea here is, if we have developed a methodology that really uh, works with probabilistic graphical models, can we use the same blueprint high level methodology and apply it to another domain? Um, and uh, this is a collaboration with Professor Theo Stewart, who is another professor of statistics, and um, George as well has joined us. And we are developing dialogue um, systems uh, for settings where people have to make uh, value trade-offs, uh, uh, you know, in order really to decide what is the best course of action. Um, and uh, when I looked at the decision analytics uh, literature, not the AI literature, in order to see what are the benefits of these explanatory tools, uh, you know, this is what uh, other uh, researchers have said. It's all about transparency, engagement, having access to an audit trail, uh, being satisfied, empowered to taking decisions, confidence, trust. Trust is very important to trust. Uh, the message to address the, the, the person or the tool that uh, conveys the message. But if you ask me, uh, and something I haven't really seen in the literature, it's all about clarity, because at the end of the day, this is why we use models. Uh, we use models in order really to help us gain this kind of clarity. And, uh, and I was talking uh, to a decision professional not uh, a long time ago and who is based in the US, and he was telling me because uh, he has as a consultancy company and he helps companies devise influence diagrams and he said sometimes you know there's a lot of effort to develop a probabilistic graphical model but then once you have it sometimes people don't even need to put and plug in probabilities you, you know they can see what the best course of action is just by exploring the space and that I think for me this is really um, my aim really to develop tools that help decision makers or policy uh, ma uh, makers in order to gain this kind of clarity. 
And um, so this is really to, to finalize, you know, just a couple of outputs from uh, uh, this, this six month uh, project. Our priority is to develop, uh, you know, just an integrated dialogue system. And uh, we believe uh, that there are many cases in the security and defense area in order really to apply our ideas. So I'm going to finish here. Thanks, Nadia. Nadia. Um, and uh, uh, turn my a bit. so um, if there's any questions, uh, please, uh, you can just turn your mic on and ask, or you can type them in the chat. Um, I, Nadia, I was, I was, I, had, I noticed that in the original Lauritsen and Spiegelhalter paper, where your example came from, they called the Bayesian networks causal networks, which links to Niels's talk before. Um, but um, the statistical relationship between the variables isn't necessarily causal. I mean, you can have the same Bayesian network and change the direction of arrows and it still represents the statistical relationship of the variables correctly. So in your um, examples in the networks where you apply this, are you trying to improve are you trying to represent the causal structure or just the probability distribution relating the variables? Uh, yes, uh, you, you know, just uh, uh, my collaborator Jim uh, uh, as well has devised uh, a phase and actually Anne Nicholson as well, you know, from Monash University has done a lot of work in the area. How can we um, capture the um, the kind of structure of the you know the the Bayesian network now this is uh, this is not an easy task uh, it is very uh, difficult but the thesis of our work is that if you provide explanation to people especially explanations that appear to be a bit counterintuitive people will say oh hang on a minute why did I get this explanation perhaps there is a missing variable there that did not really think of before uh, and it is this kind of explanations that we hope they are going to trigger this kind of thoughts in people in order really to think oh perhaps you know the uh, you know the network is not very well uh, Structured. Right. Um, so you see it as a bit of an iterative tool where you yeah. can test your assumptions and spot things that seem inconsistent and then change the change the network. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, but, but I have to say uh, uh, right now, uh, what we've done is uh, we have uh, because we started with this part, which is more about, you know, providing explanation about probabilities. Uh, but of course, you know, that was a six month project. But this is now our aim now to place an emphasis on the interrogation part, because uh, we think this is uh, th this is going to be really uh, our contribution. Uh, this is uh, our main contribution, how we can help people to devise the structure as well. But this is a much bigger problem. Uh, and this is our aim really to um, uh, so, so we're going to be really busy uh, writing proposals to identify um, funding sources in order really to focus on this phase. Do you think that the network, uh, that your system could, could, can it then sort of query people about their beliefs? You know, could it say, do you think this causes this or in order to kind of, um, you know, learn that causal network? Uh, it, 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 yes, and uh, and this is actually our aim uh, is the more we use the tool in practice, the more the tool is going to learn because, you know, the chatbot is going to have a learning component. So the more we fit dialogues uh, to the system, the more the system is going to become sensitive to these kind of questions. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, right now, it's not as if we can feed ready-made kind of dialogues that we can find in textbooks or anything into the system. Uh, and we need, uh, I think ideally, once we start developing the system, we need more and more dialogues to be inserted so that we can improve performance. That's interesting. It, it's quite hard to elicit people's prior beliefs from them. Yeah. So maybe a dialogue system is a way of actually extracting people's prior beliefs. Yeah. Uh, yes, the, uh, 
And often I tell a dream, I wish I was a fly on the wall when you did your workshops, because I have facilitated workshops myself, uh, but it was all about these high stake kind of decisions where you have value trade-offs. But he does many workshops where he elicits probabilities uh, and he also elicits tries really to build this kind of uh, of, of networks uh, and, uh, uh, and and I guess you know if this is funded you know the, the, this is going to be part of the job uh, uh, really to accumulate um, many instances or maybe we, we can organize many decision workshops to see how people can use this kind of thing in practice and how decision analysts like Jim how they interact with domain experts in order to build these very complex models um, uh, you know, that's the aim. Excellent. Um, so any questions from Nadia? Everyone's been very shy, it seems. Um, I, th I thought it was interesting. I didn't appreciate there were going to be such strong links between your part and Niels's part, actually. Yes. Um, so it sounds like this kind of whole area of using models for decisions, predictions, actions, causal inference is, you know, huge in in kind of the business side, but also in the health side. So, so it seems like there are strong links there that we can maybe build on between those two. Um, so um, it just leaves me to thank everyone. And these were the last two of 10 uh, Turing project presentations. I thought it was really interesting. Oh, we, we've got a question here. Have we? Um, <clears throat> yes, OK, so there's a comment from George. Um, that the main task of dialogue system is concerned with generation of the base net, but the explanatory facilities are concerned with realization of prediction outcomes. So I guess it's both, right? So it's eliciting a model from the dialogue and also explaining decisions. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it sounds like a great application for natural language on yeah. top of these uh, probabilistic models. Um, really nice. Um, so um, yeah, it just uh, uh, we're just left to thank uh, Nadia and let's thank Niels again. We have to do it virtually. I can do it in real life. Um, and thank you everyone. So great. Bye bye.